Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Parish in Framingham. I am Elizabeth Cavanaugh Murphy, your ministerial intern, and I use she, her pronouns. I will be your worship associate this morning, and that means I get to tell you that you have just heard the world premiere of our music director, Dean Arvidsson's latest composition written this week for this week, entitled Fair Hope. We'll look forward to hearing it again, now that we know that. First Parish in Framingham is a welcoming congregation. We celebrate and welcome people of all sexual orientations, races, ages, gender identities, abilities, and beliefs. We welcome you if you are joining us in the meeting house or on Zoom, or even if you are watching this service at a later date. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Unitarian Universalism is a progressive, inclusive faith guided by moral principles such as the worth and dignity of all. We draw inspiration from world religions and philosophies, science, history, and the arts. I draw your attention to the announcements in your order of service. That's this white sheet this morning. Immediately following worship, we will have coffee hour and we invite you to walk across the courtyard and join us in Scott Hall. For the safety and comfort of all, please remember to keep your mask on when you're inside a first parish building, unless you are actively eating or drinking. Please also turn off your phones and other devices or make them at least on their quietest possible worshipful setting. Finally, we recognize that we come here to rest or to be recharged, challenged, or affirmed. Whatever your reason for being here this morning, you belong here, maybe only for the next hour, but we hope for longer. You belong here, and we are happy to have you with us. And now I invite you to join me in taking a deep breath in and out. Continue to take a few more breaths over these next moments. Begin to let go of whatever it is you need to let go of to be more fully present to yourself, to one another, and to the sacred in this time and this place. A flame within a chalice is a primary symbol of the Unitarian Universalist faith tradition. To symbolize the light of reason, the warmth of community, and the flame of hope, it is our tradition to begin our worship by kindling the flame of our chalice. This morning I light our chalice with these words from Joseph M. Cherry. If we have any hope of transforming the world and changing ourselves, we must be bold enough to step into our discomfort, brave enough to be clumsy there, loving enough to forgive ourselves and others. May we as a people of faith be granted the strength 
to be so bold, so brave, and so loving. Please rise now in body or spirit, whichever is best for you, and join in singing hymn number 1053, that's different than the order of service, How Could Anyone? Please remain standing and join now in our congregation's sung and spoken affirmations, the words of which are printed in your order of service. the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve all life with compassion, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. This is our great covenant, one with another and with our God. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Lauren Strauss. I'm the director of religious exploration here, and I use she, her pronouns. <sighs> okay. I want to start us off by showing some love and appreciation to these wonderful, miraculous vessels that we have all been gifted. Every one of us has a body and all our bodies do this amazing thing from the day we're born till the day we die our bodies carry us where we need to go they tell us when we need something i meant to take this off like rest or nourishment or hydration they convey feelings joy sorrow love embarrassment fear all manifest all show up in our bodies 
our bodies breathe and keep our hearts pumping. They convey pleasure and pain to our brains. They create and nourish new life. They even try to protect our gentle souls from trauma. Our bodies take on physical stress whenever we experience emotional pain. Our society has taught us to disdain our wonderful bodies. Our wonderful feeling, amazing bodies, and that's more than just tragic. It is one of many attempts to try to sever our connections with our hearts, with our feelings, with the earth we walk on. You, as Unitarian Universalists, we revere the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. If we separate ourselves from our bodies and stay up in our heads, we detach a whole chunk of ourselves from the web. So let's reattach ourselves to our wonderful bodies, shall we? There is a simple and potentially hilarious way to do that, okay? Some of you may feel more comfortable trying this standing. I invite you to stand if you are comfortable doing so. Um, and as with everything, you may pass. You do not have to, but I will look really ridiculous up here doing this all by myself, so I'm really hoping. Aw, uh, you're the best. All right. Uh, so this is really hard to do with a microphone. I should have, ah, oh, there we go. All right, so the first part. Everybody take your dominant hand, so I'm using my right. Put it on your head. And take the other hand and put it on your belly. All right. Now, start your dominant hand up there going pat, 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 pat. All right, now, I can see the fear in your eyes. You all know what's coming. <laughs> Let's start the other hand rubbing. All right, and if your right hand, well, your, your head hand starts making circles or both hands suddenly start patting, just stop. And try it again. Start with the patting, add the rubbing. Y'all are good at this. Whoa. All right. Now, let's take a break. If that was super frustrating for you, or if that was, if you like just spent the whole time laughing and whatever, you're done, you can take a break. But for those of you who like, We're awkward little kids before video games and spent a whole lot of time alone in your room practicing that as well as making perfect yarn balls and the arm thing from Zoom. Um, <laughs> if that's you and you like really had that, all right, let's try one more time. This is the advanced class. Got it? <laughs> all right. Try this one. This one is hard for me. Apparently it never occurred to me to, as that awkward little kid to um, try it the other way. All right, <laughs> how are we doing? Everybody got their bodies now? All right. I'm still, every once in a while, my head, hand starts rubbing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, microphone stand, Reverend microphone stand. <laughs> All right, so now here we are in our wonderful, fantastic bodies, embodied, if you may, if you will. And you might be wondering why, why Lauren, why have we done this? Okay, here's the point. You have this beautiful, marvelous, flexible, spontaneous, capable body that carries you and holds you and works for you from cradle to grave. You, and only you, get to make decisions about what to do with your body. 
And now, I would love the children, youth, parents, interested parties to come join us in religious education as we sing exploration. Sorry, I'm still not used to that. As we sing our children out. Good morning. I am the Reverend Aaron Stockwell Wiseman, the senior minister here. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm going to be wearing my mask while I'm speaking um, today out of an abundance of caution. Uh, I met with someone on Thursday who on Friday tested positive for COVID. In our community, there is great joy and there is also great sorrow. We set aside this time because we know that joy shared is joy expanded and sorrow shared can feel as though someone is lifting a burden. As a reminder, you can write down your joys or sorrows in the book at the back of the sanctuary before the service, or you can submit those joys and sorrows online. I'll begin by sharing the sorrows and then we will sing the first verse of uh, Comfort Me. So the sorrows of our congregation. From Diane Bassett, we hear that she is holding space for her dear friend, Carmen, whose husband, Rob, passed away this week after a long illness. I share this sorrow from Ben Long, who writes that he is thinking of my grandfather, who has recently been diagnosed with cancer. I am praying, and we are all praying, Ben, that he makes a recovery. From Jim Hansen, we share this uncertainty. He writes that my father's only sister had her ovarian cancer return. After two surgeries this week, they think they got it all. She should be home in a week and will start chemotherapy too. And I lift up this sorrow submitted by Lizzie Wiseman, who reminds us that International Holocaust Remembrance Day was January 27th. We remember, mourn, and honor the millions of people murdered during the Holocaust, including six million Jewish people. And we remember that anti-Semitism continues all around us. Hate should have no place in our world. So let us sing the first verse of Comfort Me. You'll pick it up real quick if you haven't already. Comfort me, comfort me, oh my soul. Comfort me, comfort me, comfort me, oh my soul. We're also people of joys. I share this from Diane Engel, who writes, it was a joy to be reunited with distant family members. I share these joys that there is still opportunity to be involved in decorating the chancel, Marianne Orlando notes. Please see me at coffee hour if you are interested. I share this from Valerie Packard. She writes, Veronica and Amanda performed in the Little Mermaid Junior this weekend and were fantastic. And Valerie performed with her band at the Midway Cafe on Saturday and rocked it. So, in honor of that, let us sing the next verse of Comfort Me, which is Sing With Me. Sing with me, sing with me, sing with me, oh my soul. Sing with me, sing with me, sing with me, oh my soul. 
and we light one final candle for all of the joys and the sorrows which remain unspoken, those too great to share. And we sing the third verse of Comfort Me. The lyric is, Speak for Me. Speak for me, speak for me, O oh my soul. We continue now in this time of contemplation, meditation, and prayer. I invite you to return your attention to your breath in and your breath out. I also invite you to notice whatever is supporting you, a chair, a bed, a wall, the community that you are a part of. Feel to the connection to the ground beneath us. Imagine your feet taking root in this beautiful planet. O oh, spirit of life and love, named and unnamed, but who calls us each by our true first name, which is beloved. We give thanks for all of the joys, spoken and unspoken. We give thanks for this community for those leaders who make it go, for the people who volunteer on committees making this church go. We give thanks too for the food in our bellies and the walls and roofs that support us. We know that it did not have to be this way. We know too that there are those in our community who wonder when they will be able to eat again, when they will have a light in their house, when they will have a home. We know that there are those who are ill, those who are mourning, and those who live with addiction, those who are lonely. O oh, Spirit, give us courage and strength. If we are those people, we need all the courage and strength. And we need the strength and support of our community as well. As we are able, may we lend a helping hand and a listening ear. We know too that Though there might be peace in our home, there is turmoil elsewhere. May all know peace and may we work to bring peace, ending oppression in all of its forms. This morning, I lift up the people of Ukraine, now approaching almost a year living in a war zone. I lift up in memory all those killed by gun violence in the last week. I lift up to Tyree Nichols and his life and the things that he liked to do best. He was killed by police in Memphis on January 10th, I believe. But let us remember a man who skateboarded, who took photos, and who was just watching the sunset. May we work to bring more justice into our world. And because we are breathing, because we have bodies, because 
because we are alive, oh, do we make mistakes sometimes. We fumble with our words, we fall, we stumble. We can be hard on ourselves. May we each remember that we are loved and lovable, not in spite of these imperfections, but because of them. And when we have fallen out of right relationship, may we be reminded that we can be gentle with ourselves, and that there's always time to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. How can I do better? I say these words and do all things for love's sake. Let us now sit in the quiet of this community. We will sit for a time and I will keep track of the time. This might be time for you to listen or rest. Pray the prayers of your own hearts or simply do nothing for a time. May it be so, and amen. This morning's offering words were written by the Reverend Dr. Victoria Weinstein. The purpose of the church is to encourage all who gather there to grow more generous in spirit and in action. This is the great end of all the world's faith traditions, to bring the human being closer to the divine by acts of creation and compassion. We now take an offering that allows us to exercise that all important generosity of spirit an offering that will support this self-supporting church and its many ministries. If this is your first time joining us, you are invited to let the offering pass you by. The gifts of the congregation will now be most gratefully received. a.m. day after Christmas I throw some clothes on in the dark the smell of cold car seat is freezing the world is sleeping and I am numb 
up the stairs to her apartment. She is balled up on the couch. Her mom and dad went down to Charlotte. And they're not home to find us out. And we drive. Now that I have found someone, now I'm feeling more alone than I ever have before. She's a brick and I'm drowning slowly off the coast and I'm headed nowhere. She's a brick and I'm drowning slowly. They call her name at 7.30. I pace around the parking lot. Then I go down to buy her flowers and sell some gifts that I got. And can't you see? It's not me you're dying for. Now she's feeling more alone than she ever has before. She's a brick and I'm drowning slowly off the coast and I'm headed nowhere. She's a brick and I'm drowning slowly. As weeks went by, it showed that she was not fine. They told me, son, it's time to tell the truth that she broke down, and I broke down, cause I was tired of lying. Driving back to her apartment For the moment we're alone She's alone and I'm alone And now I know it She's a brick and I'm drowning slowly Off the coast and I'm headed nowhere She's a brick and I'm drowning slowly Our reading this morning is the text of the 2015 Statement of Conscience on Reproductive Justice adopted by our Unitarian Universalist Association. As Unitarian Universalists, we embrace the reproductive justice framework which espouses the human right to have children, not to have children, to parent the children one has in healthy environments, to safeguard bodily autonomy, and to express one's sexuality freely. The reproductive justice movement was founded at a time when the unique range of issues faced by women of color were not addressed by the predominantly white middle-class women's rights and reproductive rights movements, nor the predominantly male civil rights movement. Those issues have included forced sterilization, forced contraception, 
and higher rates of removal of children from families due to accusations of abuse or neglect. These issues coupled with systemic racism have frequently made parenting or co-parenting more difficult due to many factors, including but not limited to discriminatory and unequal implementation of laws and incarceration rates, prohibitions imposed on people after incarceration, unjust immigration policies, and economic insecurity. Reproductive justice is the term created by women of color in 1994 to center the experience of the most vulnerable and to bridge the gap between reproductive rights and other social justice movements. Some of these women helped to found Sister Song and have explained that the reproductive justice framework, and I quote, represents a shift for women advocating for control of their bodies from a narrower focus on legal access and individual choice to a broader analysis of racial, economic, cultural, and structural constraints on their power. Reproductive justice addresses the social reality of inequality, specifically the inequality of opportunities that women of color have to control their reproductive destiny." End quote. We as Unitarian Universalists declare that all people have the right to self-expression with regard to gender and sexuality, and the right to live free from sexual violence, intimate partner violence, and exploitation, including sexual and reproductive exploitation. The reproductive justice movement envisions the liberation of people of all genders, sexual orientations, abilities, gender identities, ages, classes, and cultural and racial identities. Such liberation requires not only accurate information about sexuality and reproduction and control of personal reproductive decisions, but also living wages, safe and supported housing, high quality and comprehensive medical and reproductive health care, access to voting and the political process, affordable legal representation, fair immigration policies, paid parental leave, affordable child care, and the absence of individual and institutional violence. The world we envision includes social, political, legal, and economic systems that support everyone's freedom of reproductive choice and expression of gender, identity, and sexuality, especially the most vulnerable and marginalized. In such a world, all communities are places of equality, abundance, and safety, free from violence, oppression, and hazardous environments. This world includes access to safe, affordable, and culturally and developmentally appropriate childcare and health care. In our vision, everyone has access to accurate information about sexuality and family planning and safe, 
healthy and culturally sensitive reproductive health services. Before I begin, Kevin, thank you for that stunning rendition of Brick. Um, ben Folds wrote this song uh, in memory of his high school girlfriend getting an abortion. So that is why we heard that today. As you might remember, I am preaching a loose sermon series on prophetic witness. In September, I introduced what prophetic witness is. In November, I preached on democracy and how do we strengthen it. Today, I am preaching about reproductive justice and in April, I will preach about climate justice. And of course, there are so many other forms of injustice that I could be preaching on, but those are the ones that we are focusing on this year. To refresh your memory, here is what I mean when I say prophetic witness. A lot of people have written about it over the years, but the best writing was that of James Luther Adams. Adams was a Unitarian theologian of the 20th century. He wrote that the prophetic liberal church is not a church in which the prophetic function is assigned merely to a few. The prophetic liberal church is the church in which persons think and work together to interpret the signs of the times in light of their faith, to make, through, to make explicit through discussion the epical thinking that the times demand. The prophetic liberal church, he writes, is the church in which all members share the common responsibility to attempt to foresee the consequences of human behavior both in individual and institutional, with the intention of making history in place of merely being pushed around by it. The prophethood of all is different from the traditional definition of prophetic witness. Traditionally, the prophets couldn't go to school to learn the ways and wisdom to learn how to be prophetic. Indeed, they did not have a how-to guide about how to be prophetic. The prophets of old had fire in their mouths and didn't need to read a manual. There was nothing they could do but speak. Being a prophet in the biblical sense also involves an optimism and an imagination. We know that there is injustice because we believe that another world is possible. The prophets were not pessimistic they were maybe realistic or at least optimistic. There is that gap between the world as it is and the world we dream about. And that tragic gap is heartbreaking. And that's how we know what work needs to be done. And this morning I am speaking about reproductive justice. Why? Because there is something still novel in this day and age for an or an ordained, straight, white, cisgender male to say that I believe that we must work to bring reproductive justice to all because my faith says so. Especially since so often the loudest voices against reproductive justice are people who look like me. I speak of reproductive justice this morning because our denomination, since 1963, two years after it was formed, has affirmed the right to abortion for people who want it. It affor affirmed reproductive justice nearly 10 years before Roe v. Wade was ruled. This is a religious right that we affirm and promote. As a denomination, we are pro anyone who wants an abortion for whatever reason, having access to get that safe abortion, no matter the gender, no matter the reason, we believe that abortion is health care. Now, we heard Elizabeth read one of the more recent statements of conscience from our denomination's General Assembly. This is a theological issue to us because, a little bit further on in the statement of conscience, we hear that we are relational beings with varying abilities, preferences, and identities. Unitarian Universalism calls us to advocate 
for the positive expression of sexuality, including choices about reproduction and nurturing, and for a culture of respect and empowerment. Our commitment to our principles calls us to support and partner with oppressed communities as we work together to build the world that we dream about. In order to embody our principles, we as Unitarian Universalists must listen to and follow the lead of those from the affected communities, especially women of color, and reach outside of our cultural assumptions. Our religious tradition directs us to respect the diversity of faith traditions that surround us and insist that no singular religious viewpoint or creed guide the policies of our government. And I speak this morning of reproductive justice because last week was supposed to have been the 50th anniversary of the Roe v. Wade ruling. As we know, it was overturned by the Supreme Court last summer at the end of their turn. Now you'll notice that I am speaking about reproductive justice, not just rights. This is a shift. How is it different? Reproductive justice as a framework affirms four key things. One, the right to not have a child. Two, the right to have a child. Three, the right to parent a child in safe and healthy environments. And also that people have a right to health and self-determination regarding their bodies and sexuality, free from oppression and shame. This represents a shift, as we heard before, for women advocating for control of their bodies from a narrower focus on legal access and individual choice to a broader analysis of racial, economic, cultural, and structural constraints on their power. It is holistic and intersectional. Intersectional, as you might be aware, was coined in 1989 by legal theorist Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. She used a traffic metaphor describing in her work that black women stand or exist at an intersection of race and gender streets, vulnerable to energy from cars traveling along either axis. Reproductive justice, according to uh, these two authors, Solinger and Ross, remind us that even in states where abortion is legal, it is not always equally affordable. They remind us that women with money or private health insurance may choose to have an abortion within the guidelines of various state restrictions. But women who cannot afford to pay for their health care, such as those on Medicaid or those whose health care is provided by the federal government, people in the military, on Indian reservations, or in the Peace Corps, are prohibited from using their health care insurance anywhere to pay for an abortion. Solinger and Ross's book helped make me aware of the history of reproductive justice, and it really turned some of my thinking on its head, and other parts of the book really frustrated me, by which I mean they were enlightening to me to see how insidious racism is in the realm of reproductive rights and justice. Ross and Solinger remind us that millions found ways to curb their fertility especially during the Great Depression of the 1930s. They gathered in labor union settings and in maternity and infant settings for women, uh, for African Americans in the South. Women opened their homes to door-to-door -door contraceptive salesmen. Many purchased preparations from the Sears and Roebuck catalog and responded to advertisements. But then, as is apt to happen, Politicians got involved where they shouldn't be involved. The authors remind us that the American Medical Association endorsed birth control as a, quote, proper sexual practice. The organization insisted that doctors retain authority over, um, over birth control and women's access to it. Public health officials developed birth control clinics for poor African Americans only as only part as a service to women. The key goal, these authors write, was to serve the public good by reducing black fertility. 
They go on to say that long before female contraception was decriminalized, condoms were provided to soldiers during World War II, and condoms were listed as approved prophylactics in the 1930s. Using the principle of public health, the government itself promoted a strategy for separating sex and pregnancy, at least for men. They point out that the government gets involved in many private decisions, ensuring that it is accessible, affordable, and safe. They lift up the example of air travel, for one. The federal government, they write and remind us, determines the placement of airports in that they are reasonably accessible to all. It ensures that fares remain relatively affordable, and it places limits for safety on the staff that are on airplanes, as well as the airliners themselves. They ask, why can't the government ensure the same things for reproductive justice, that it is accessible, affordable, and safe. And these authors are quick to point out the benefits of reproductive justice to women who cannot give birth, trans women, older women, surgically sterilized women, as well as those who are biologically infertile, are vulnerable to control and degradation, degradation because of their perceived incapacity or barrenness. Now, I think this is an important reminder that my colleague, the Reverend Rob Keithen, reminds us of. He says that the end goal of organizing for reproductive justice, health, and rights is not that every person has the same political views or religious views or personal views on abortion. The dominant cultural framework consciously and unconsciously encourages us to think that only a narrow, single perspective is possible for or against pro-access or pro-choice and pro-life. To some extent, public opinion polling reinforces this motion by constantly asking people whether or not they think there should be legal access to abortion. The more relevant question is who should decide? Respect for bodily autonomy is a core principle of reproductive justice, and religious freedom is a core principle of American democracy. Taken together, the result is straightforward. Every person should be able to make decisions about their bodies and access health care according to their beliefs and values. Whether or not someone chooses abortion and how they feel about it is up to them. The goal is not that everyone feels the same. The goal is that everyone has access and support for what they need. So I just said a lot of things to you. And as I get to this point in any sermon up on prophetic witness, I wonder, so what can I do? What can we do as a faith community? If the conversation isn't about making sure that everyone has the same views on reproductive justice, and that would likely take quite a while. It is then about access and support for what they need. And I say to you that we are actually doing a fair bit already. Our support of the diaper project affirms the right to parent a child in safe and healthy environments in clean environments, as does our support of family promise. These are real and tangible things and huge things that help people in our communities, as does our support of local food pantries, as does our support of the Metro West Free Medical Program, especially in the realm of women's health. We also teach our whole lives to eighth graders and seventh through ninth graders, depending on what a global pandemic does to our cycle of teaching, because we believe that comprehensive sexuality education is important. This too is a part of reproductive justice. It ensures that graduates of that program know that they have the right to not have a child. In a world where there is so much shame and disinformation about sex, it is important to make sure that our youth are not just informed for themselves alone, but that they become a source of good 
scientifically based information for their peers. I've heard this happen time and again from teaching our whole lives, which I did once in my internship, and I've heard many other parents describe this. Our youth become resources for their peers in the realm of sexuality education. And this program, which we developed with the United Church of Christ, exists from pre-kindergarten, our curriculum from pre-kindergarten to older adulthood. We believe that correct information matters. Other things that we can do as individuals include working to affect positive change within our social circles and professions, supporting reproductive justice as active participants or accountable allies, considering these issues when voting, and working to eliminate barriers, economic, educational, language, accessibility, etc., to reproductive justice services. So my friends gathered here, this work appears daunting. Any work worth doing can seem so large, and that is okay. This is a thing that we do, not by preaching a sermon or listening to a sermon once about reproductive justice or doing one thing and then resting on our laurels. It is about discerning and figuring out how do we do the next right thing? May we discern together and individually what our next right thing might be. May it be so, and amen. Let us now join our voices together by singing hymn number 354, We Laugh, We Cry.
thank you for joining us this morning. As we go forth, I send these words of gratitude to our staff team, as well as to our ushers, Pam and Beth, Tom Ostfeld, and maybe Pete. Is Pete up there? Pete is also up there. Thank you, uh, our tech operators, as well as our fabulous choir and Kevin for singing Brick. So I send you forth to the rest of your Sunday. As we leave this friendly place, let us take the light of love out into the world and use it to brighten our pathways. And when we need to rest or recharge, be challenged or affirmed, may that light guide us safely back. May we hold the light always and the light hold us always. We extinguish our chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. Go in peace and go in love. <laughs>